Good morning, church. Great to be with you. As Bo and Alice just told us, we're going to talk a little together about the bride of Jesus Christ and Jesus being the bridegroom. But before we talk about that, I just want to set the stage for the next couple months. I'm very excited that we're going to focus on a series of the New Testament's images of the church of Jesus Christ. The Bride of Christ is the first one, but we're going to spend nine weeks exploring all the different images of the church, the Bride of Jesus Christ. So if I asked you, do you love church? What would you say? Well, awesome. That's probably why you're here. Some mornings, maybe you get up and say, eh, I don't love church. Or... I love faith church, but the church is not a building. The church is the people. And Jesus Christ is crazy about the church, about you, the bride of Christ, as the church. In Forest City, Iowa, I remember officiating at a wedding where the groom did, as life work, quarterback clinics all over the nation. He would travel and teach young men how to be a better quarterback. Well, life happens in the middle of weddings, wouldn't you agree? So here we are in the middle of the ceremony, and it's time to exchange the rings, and he drops her ring. And it rolls about 12 feet over and starts spinning. And one of his groomsmen yells, Fumble! And dives for the ring. (laughs) You couldn't make that stuff up. (laughs) For those of you who are married, do you remember your wedding day? If so, what do you remember? I remember being in this little room, the sacristy off the front of St. John's Lutheran in Depew, Iowa, and there is my father who's going to officiate, three brothers and one other friend who were groomsmen. And my brother Paul, the one that was a little bit of a black sheep in the family, played pro football, and he turns to me about three minutes before the wedding's due to start, and he said, I'll take you right out this side door now, and we can go to Mexico together if you'd like. (laughs) My father did not look kindly on him at that moment. But I remember standing in the front of the church and seeing Denise, my bride, on the arm of Orville coming down the aisle. I remember my heart feeling like it was going to leap out of my chest. Do you remember those feelings? Now think about Jesus Christ and how he feels about the church, about you individually, yes, but about the church. The church is not perfect, is it? We are not a perfect body of Christ, but Jesus Christ is crazy about the church. The other thing I want you to think about is even though Jesus is crazy about the church, and there's this whole series of images we're going to explore. I always want us to think about how the church is missional. So Jen found this fantastic picture for us that is going to be our bulletin cover for a couple months of uh, this image of a church, the inside of a church, and the street that runs right down the middle of it. Any of you old enough to remember the Doobie Brothers? Taking it to the streets. The church meets in worship, right? But the church always goes out the doors. And when the cars leave the parking lot, there goes the church. Because the church is the bride of Christ and the church is the people of Jesus Christ. So we always want to think about not only that we are loved by the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, but what is our mission? What is the so what of all these different images? So the image is today, Jesus, our bridegroom, and we are the bride of Christ. 
the first thing I want to say about Jesus the bridegroom is he pursues his bride to rescue us. It's said in the passage Eric read for us from Ephesians, as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. I googled this week, husbands rescue their wife. The first story was of a woman, a husband and a wife in Japan who had a tremendous argument. And the husband went to bed and the wife was so miffed that she set fire to the house, quote, to annoy my husband. He woke up overcome by smoke and realized that his wife also had fallen asleep and he rescued the wife that set fire to the house. It reminds me of uh, Winston Churchill. A woman came up to Winston Churchill and said, so ticked at Winston Churchill that she said, if you were my husband, I'd poison you. You know what Churchill said? If you were my wife, I'd drink it. (laughs) Here's a series of uh, examples of the husband devoted to the wife so much that he rescued her. There was a story about a missionary, an NBC intern who left that work in the news and television industry to become an intern in Haiti. You remember a few years back when there was that terrible earthquake in Haiti and he was doing mission work about eight hours from Port-au-Prince where his wife was staying behind And he drove the eight hours, and then he dug in the rubble for ten hours straight to find and free his wife. Or the husband who drowned trying to save his wife in the riptide currents off Miami Beach. Or in 2011, there was a man from Gwembe, Zambia, Africa, whose wife was attacked by a big crocodile. The crocodile is swimming with his wife into the deep water, and the man finds out that that happened, and he dives into the croc-infested waters, and he comes to that crocodile who's holding his wife by her thigh, grabs the crocodile around the belly, drags the crocodile to the shallows, puts his arm down in the mouth of the crocodile to try and pry his mouth open to get his wife out, then starts slugging the crocodile on top of the head. And finally, the crocodile loosens its bite on his wife and goes after him, misses him, and their two people, both bloodied but safe. I like those stories. I like reading Louis L'Amour novels and reading about how the hero cowboy gets the girl. Every Popeye has an olive oil to rescue, right? Every Tarzan has a Jane to rescue. The bridegroom, Jesus Christ, comes to love and rescue the bride. We are the bride of Christ. It's the whole plot line of this book that God, the bridegroom, loved the people of God so much that he came to rescue us that we would live and revel in his love. But the bridegroom, Jesus, also comes for his bride to propose to us. For even though he rescues us, he invites us to respond to his love. And every proposal requires a response. 
And by the way, not to respond is to respond. So we've got a little video that uh, illustrates the point. We'll take a look here. Love is more than passion. Love is also commitment. So you've probably seen that movie, Runaway Bride, and laughed at the humor of a woman unable to make the commitment. But we, the bride of Christ, are invited to respond to the proposal of the bridegroom. We say yes to God's yes, right? Can you say yes to God's yes? yes. I like it. Can you say it with enthusiasm? Yes. I like it. So we are committed to say yes as the bride to Jesus, the bridegroom. The third thing about Jesus as the bridegroom to the bride is he protects and guards his bride and keeps us safe. In Psalm 62, it says, Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. I remember a wedding I officiated at where the groom was so nervous, so anxious, so fidgety. It was a hot day, and it was stuffy in the sanctuary, and the bride fainted, just down, right in place. And the groom was so nervous, he just stood there and looked at her. He never moved. The best man stepped around him and helped her. Jesus is the bridegroom who embraces you in his arms to keep you safe. You can revel in the promise of his strength and comfort to never let go of you. He will protect you. In his love. But when Jesus, the bridegroom, says that to us, it also means, as the scripture says, that he's jealous in his love. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, the scripture says. Now, the negative aspect to jealousy might be that we are insecure or afraid in the love, mistrustful to the point that we're always worried about the faithfulness of the one we love. But the positive element to jealousy, as the scriptures is, dividing, is describing the heart of God, is that he is devoted exclusively to one. Therefore, he's jealous. The scripture even uses the image of the prophet Hosea called by God to commit himself in the covenant of marriage to a woman named Gomer, who was a lady of the evening, a woman of the street. He pays for her to be his wife, buys her. They share love, share life. She has two children, and then she goes back to her former life. Do you know what God says through Hosea? I betrothed myself to you forever. So he tells Hosea as a physical manifestation of the truth of the love of God that he's supposed to go back and take Gomer into his house and love again. So Hosea goes and pays for Gomer to be his wife again. He fights for her and takes her into his house and loves her like she was never unfaithful. That's Jesus Christ to the bride of Christ, the church. He fights for us and he forgives all our stupid foolishness and our immorality and our unfaithfulness. He says, no, remember, you belong to me. Come, live in my love. The bridegroom, Jesus, protects his bride. Here's another truth. The bridegroom prays for his bride. Jesus prays for the church. It says in Romans 8, that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. But then it says, Jesus died and was raised. He's at the right hand of God, interceding for us. There's a story told 
And there was a movie made called Out of Africa. It's about a true story of a Danish noblewoman named Baroness Karen Blixen. She lived in Kenya. She was the owner of a large coffee plantation. And working for her were an African tribe known as the Kikuyu. And they lived right on her property. In the aftermath of World War II, there was some economic hardship. And uh, Karen von Blixen lost her coffee plantation. And when she lost it, this new owner cared not at all for the Kikuyu people. But Blixen couldn't forget those precious people to her heart. She begged the new owner to not displace them, kick them off the land. They, he wouldn't listen. So she appealed to the government authorities, but they also would do nothing to help the Kikuyu tribe. So there was this big banquet to honor the newly elected governor of that region of Africa. And the noblewoman, Karen von Blixen, uh, ignored all appropriate protocol and embarrassed and even humiliated herself, rushed forth in line. Everybody's trying to hold her back. She falls on her knees in front of the governor and takes his hands in hers and pleads with him to do something to help the Kikuyu people. Everybody is like hanging their heads or looking the other way at this demonstration of her devotion and her ignorance of protocol. But she was impassioned to beg for her people that she loved. Finally, the wife of the governor rose and said, you have my word that the governor will protect the Kikuyu people. Now take that to Jesus Christ. He prays for his bride. He is the Lord of creation. He's the one who went to the cross for you and I and was raised from the dead. He's the Lord of eternity. He's the Lord of life. But now, even now this morning, Jesus is in the presence of the Father praying for the church, interceding for you by name. Isn't that beautiful? The next thing that the bridegroom does is he perfects his bride in the deep intimacy of his love. He protects and, perf excuse me, he perfects us. So in the process of sharing life and love with Jesus Christ, we are changed by his love. The more you understand how much he loves you, the more you understand how secure you are in his love, that you have been forgiven and that you are forever his because of the faithfulness of his promise, the more his love just changes how you see the reality of life. Now in a few minutes, we're going to share in Holy Communion. If you think of this, not just spiritually, but even physically, you are going to ingest a little gift of bread and wine. But the bread and wine are digested and assimilated into your body. And in a physical sense as well as a spiritual sense, in the grace of the bridegroom, you become one with him. In his mind... The scripture says that we have the mind of Christ willing to serve. In our emotions, in gratitude, the more we learn to love Jesus, the more inclined we are to love others in his name. We're perfected in his love. But then it says that we're presented by Jesus in the fullness of his glory it says in Isaiah 61, I'm overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in the robe of righteousness. When Denise and my family were quite young, we went to a motel and stayed the night. Our kids were really pumped to go swimming in the pool, but I found that I had forgotten my swimming suit. So the motel had this vending machine where they sold 
paper weave swimsuits. What could go wrong with that? <laughs> so I'm swimming happily in my vending machine suit about 20 minutes into our time in the pool, and my little daughter, Andrea, who was probably seven at the time, says, Daddy, is the back of your suit supposed to be hanging down like that? <laughs> I hollered for Denise to bring a towel. Have you ever had moments in your life where you were just plain exposed? <laughs> the truth about life is... The bride is not perfect. You and I are not perfect. But Jesus promises not just to cover our nakedness. It says in the same passage in Isaiah 61 that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So the wedding day is not only that he covers my nakedness and he replaces my filthy, dirty rags with beautiful garments, but then as I am dressed in his glorious love, with pride he presents the bride on the wedding day. Church, that's you. You're the bride of Christ, dressed in the glory of Jesus Christ's love. Never hang your head. Never continue to beat yourself up over what you wish had never happened. Believe the promise that Jesus Christ has dressed you beautifully. So someday, there's going to be a wedding day. It says in the word of God that he'll come on the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him will see him when he comes in power and glory. When I was a boy, I remember my mom was a stay-at-home mom. I came home from school one day on a week where the Sunday previous, my dad had preached about the rapture, the promise in the scriptures that someday the church will be pulled out of this world by the power of God and will go to eternity to be with God. So I come home from school, and my mom is not there. My mom is always there when I come home. What did this little boy's brain think? That God had come, Jesus had come, had taken the church, and I was left behind. I remember being terrified that I was left behind. But the promise of the scriptures is Jesus Christ has prepared us for that wedding day. He did go to the cross. He was raised from the dead. He does promise to clothe us in the garments of his glory so that we can trust and believe. Even again to say it in faith. I believe in you, Jesus. I thank you for your robes of righteousness. I believe I'm forgiven. I believe I am yours. I believe I live in your love. I belong to you. Like it says in the Song of Songs, I am my beloved's and he is mine. And his banner over us is love. John Stott, a famous and powerful Christian of the previous century, influenced many in his role as a pastor, as a teacher, as a writer, a New Testament scholar. And a man named Oz Guinness tells about how, shortly before Stott died, that he, this friend, went to visit Stott. He said they talked for over an hour about common memories of their life shared, and then before Guinness left Stott, he said, is there anything I can pray for you about? And here's what John Stott, who had dedicated his whole life to serving Jesus Christ, had written, preached, taught about Jesus all his life. He said, pray that I can be faithful to Jesus Christ till my last breath. Church, we are the bride of Jesus Christ We can bask in the love of the Prince of Love. Our purpose as the Bride of Christ is to share Jesus' love with as many people as God brings into our lives. But always, it's with an eye to the sky 
knowing that today or any day might be the day that the bridegroom comes to take his bride home. And that will be our wedding day. Amen.